Dan Dowd. I'm the Vice President of Medical Affairs here at Genomind. Um, today is the Genomind's Grand Rounds entitled Pharmacogenetics and its Role in Psychiatric Medications. Um, you can see on your screen there, Dr. Daniel Mueller, um, a world-renowned pharmacogeneticist, and let me introduce him. I'll read his bio. Um, we will spend about 45 minutes here uh, with Dr. Mueller presenting on pharmacogenetics and psychiatric care. We'll save 15 minutes at the end for Q&A, uh, but feel free to add your questions into that Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen right now. And then I'll be the, uh, I'll be the moderator of questions in the last 15 minutes. So let me introduce our speaker. So Dr. Daniel Mueller, MD, PhD, is head of the pharmacogenetics research clinic at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, which is one of, its, one of the first of its kind worldwide to implement pharmacogenetics in clinical practice for antidepressant and antipsychotic medications. Dr. Mueller is actively involved in developing pharmacogenetic treatment recommendations for physicians and patients through his close collaboration with international organ organizations such as CPIC, the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium, and the International Society of Psychiatric Genetics, as well as the Pharmacogenetics Research Network. Throughout his career, Dr. Mueller's research goals have been to investigate genetic causes of response and side effects to psychiatric medications, on which he has published more than 200 articles. So this line of research aims to significantly improve the treatment of psychiatric conditions and to lessen the burden of medication side effects and avoid adverse drug-drug interactions. So with all that being said, Daniel Mueller, please take it away. Thank you. And again, uh, thank you so much for uh, having me, for inviting me. It's, it's a great pleasure and honor. Um, uh, this is what I really like to do the most is to talk about, uh, um, to talk about things, uh, why we need them, how we should do them. And, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and uh, also, um, you know, giving giving some some outlooks uh, and perspectives on the on this topic. So, title is pharmacogenetics in its role in psychiatric medications, and I'm going to take you through it now. Um, so, first a few disclosures. Uh, I've been co-investigator on two pharmacogenetic studies uh, with in-kind contributions by Mirad Neurosciences. Uh, neuroscience these studies are conducted and completed. I have not received any payment or equity stocks from any pharmacogenetic company, or, and I'm a co-investigator on two patent assessing risk for any second use weight gain, still pending and not being used at this point of time. So I'm working at the Center for Addiction Mental Health in Toronto. That's Canada's largest mental health hospital. And just to give you an idea, uh, you know, we see these increasing numbers of people using our emergency room services. Um, and as you can see, you know, within, within eight, nine years, we've actually seen a doubling of numbers and this trend is continuing. And, uh, you know, regardless of COVID-19, uh, you know, the numbers keeps continuing. And I'm mentioning this right away from the get-go because, you know, the idea of doing personalized medicine is not just because it is a great idea, but it's also a necessity in order to uh, handle and address, um, you know, the, the, the increasing demands on our healthcare system. Uh, here locally, but also globally. So, so that means the tools that we currently have, unless we find maybe better antidepressants or whatever, <clears throat> uh, which, uh, which I hope we will, but for the time being, we just need to do better in what we're currently offering. And the quote here from Sir William Osler, um, physician from the 19th century, if this were not for the great variability among individuals, medicine might as well be a science and not an art, which is a bit ironic, but reminds us that one of the, one of the main challenges is the inter-individual variability. And that is also why treatment takes so long, treatment can get so complicated and frustrating and leading people to, to go away and uh, seek their own luck with, with you know, non-evidence-based treatment. And unfortunately, the situation has not changed very much. Now, I would argue that we are still, as physicians, um, having some you know, variables in mind each time we do prescribe medications. It's not that we're doing it completely unpersonalized, right? We will take a look at the age of the, of the subject uh, to come, uh, their gender, the ancestry, and what are the clinical symptoms, and also are there other, other, other drugs or are there maybe also substances? that might interfere, and then we make a decision, right? Uh, most likely which type of antidepressant and psychotic we're gonna use. So there is some personalization going on. But, but the argument here is that if we look at drug gene interactions at, uh, in addition to it, then we can probably even do better 
and tackle this problematic variability. And from a pharmacological perspective, we can clearly differentiate two compartments every time a person takes a pill, the pill would, will get somehow um, uh, metabolized, which means, uh, you know, um, broken down and absorbed and, and, and distributed across, across the organs. And that's the pharmacokinetic component, what, what the uh, body is doing to the drug. And then ultimately those compounds and metabolites will come and reach the target organs uh, for us in psychiatry is going to be the brain where neurotransmitter systems are mostly, uh, you know, mostly um, affected. And that's the pharmacodynamic component, what the body does to the drug. And again, then we judge response to side effects typically later on and see whether this treatment was a good thing or maybe it didn't work or the side effects and so on. Keeping again in mind also the other variables that I mentioned earlier, which might interfere. So uh, there's a whole lot of complexity here going on uh, nowadays. And as I will see, as you will see in the in the presentation, uh, I think you know the 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 real um, the treasure trove is uh, is with pharmacokinetics. Is you know uh, uh, mostly, and with some hypersensitivity, uh, uh, you know reactions that I will talk talk about briefly. But keep in mind that we have a very good understanding how medications are metabolized, while we don't have a good understanding really what they're doing once they have targeted uh, transporters or, or receptors. Um, the downstream cascades in the complex uh, you know, architecture of the brain are still not yet fully understood. So there's a lot to find there. But for the time being, uh, we, can, we can very nicely go and um, at least adjust medications according to the individual pharmacokinetic profile. And what are these? What are these enzymes and genes? So uh, this is a graph uh, which shows which CYP enzymes, phase one enzymes, uh, are mostly involved in the in the metabolism of psychiatric medication. And you can see a huge component here goes to the CYP twenty six, and then CYP twenty four, and then CYP twenty nineteen, and CYP one eighty two. <clears throat> However, <clears throat> only two of them, CYP twenty six and CYP twenty nineteen, show a great genetic variation which is even more so important because for CYP2D6, uh, actually the presence or the frequency of, of the, of the CYP2D6 in the liver is relatively low, which means the system is quickly getting oversaturated, overwhelmed, and that's the problem with CYP2D6. So we have a huge variation and we have only very little CYP2D6 to begin with. So that's called a low capacity, high affinity situation, and that's why CYP2D6 is extremely critical and again, we have people have no CYP and 26 activity. Those are the poor metabolizers. And we have those rapid metabolizers, which have gene duplications of CYP26. Such variation is really unheard of for many other genes in, the, in our genome. <clears throat> and what it really means is, you know, if you start giving, for example, paroxetine, which is primarily metabolized by 26, means that if you give a standard dose, which starts at 20, 30, 40 milligrams, you will see a huge variation of plasma levels of paroxetine. And you can see that the poor metabolizer is exceedingly high there, uh, you know, really skyrocketing, skyrocketing uh, with their plasma levels. Or at the ultra rapid, almost seem like they would be non compliant if you don't know about their metabolizer status. And that is known information for some time. <clears throat> the question then is, you know, why are we still doing, you know, first the the classic approach, giving people medication, and then they, and then later on see if they respond or not, without without looking up front what the genetic status might be, which could help us, uh, you know, to to guide medications better. Why not? Well, there are many reasons, but I think one of them uh, I will mention in a moment uh, is uh, the frequency. But let's first take a look at a case report in order to demonstrate and highlight the importance of 2D6. So this is a real life case which happened in the US in the 1990s, where a young man, 36 years old, was suffering from depression, <clears throat> went to the doctor, went to the physician, and was given amitriptyline, which was which a classic tricyclic antidepressant, and then was given this new medication that was relatively uh, new on the market, Prozac or fluoxetine, and that was titrated up to 40 milligrams. What happened then, unfortunately, was six weeks later, the gentleman was found dead in his apartment. And uh, uh, then the autopsy, the coroners uh, noted an excessive level of amitriptyline uh, in the blood system, which was then attributed to, to suicide. Unfortunately, uh, and, and to, to, the, to, to, of course, to the great chagrin of the, of the family members, they, they could not believe that this was a suicide. Uh, in addition, the life insurance wouldn't pay, so that, that triggered further analysis or because of that. 
And here, um, the, the author of this paper, Dr. Prescorn, he had this idea of measuring plasma levels in different body compartments. Um, and he found that actually the, the, these plasma levels were exactly the same in all, in, all, in all three body compartments, even those who are perfused very slowly, which indicates that this intoxication has occurred gradually over time and not in a one-time in a one-time you know, uh, 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 ingestion. And that was because this, this, fatal, this fatality happened because now with giving a, a drug which, which inhibits CYP26, which fluoxetine does, amitriptyline could no longer be well metabolized. And over the time, and amitriptyline is then accumulated and reached this, this toxic dose, which typically leads to arrhythmia and cardiac death. So now, of course, this was a complete different situation. First of all, for the relatives uh, who were also relieved that, you know, uh, to some extent that the death wasn't caused by suicide, which always causes, you know, pain uh, and guilt feelings and so on in family members, but also the life insurance paid. And now the case was known and that has led since then, you know, to be much, uh, to, be, to be aware of this interaction. So um, that was, however, a demonstration how important CYP26 alone can be and if you wish, it's a little bit like almost a monogenic condition. If you know what a monogenic condition is, means is means it means that is, if one gene is disrupted and you get you know you get um, exposed to certain certain things, um, certain certain you know metabolites, and you cannot metabolize them, you get into problems like phenylketonuria and so on. So here we say you know here we can see that that gene is extremely important to run well if you if you use medications metabolized by CYP26. <clears throat> Again, it's a lethal consequence. If you, it can have lethal consequences if you have a CYP26 impairment. And keep in mind, there are people born as if they were taking fluoxetine all their lives, and these are the poor metabolizers. So I mentioned why is this not being standard then to do a testing, which is which can be obtained for you know not not a lot of money these days. Um, well, the reason is simply because most people, most you know, if you take this random sample here of you know 362 uh, Europeans, most people are normal metabolizers, and only five to ten percent maximum will be at the at these those ends, right? So I think you know we have to do with with extreme effects with outliers effect first of all five to ten percent uh is 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 not enough probably to raise attention at a at a you know at a global level so to speak you know to look into those genotypes prior to doing uh to do you know um to do prescriptions and however i caution against this because this is just a sample of europeans and uh, within europeans there is variation but in, but with other um uh, you know ancestry groups or ethnicity groups uh, you know, you can see even up to 40% in Northeast Africa of rapid metabolizers, right? So it's no longer than outliers, in fact. It really depends on the population you look at. And in a diverse population in, in, global, in, in a globalized world, I, you know, you, 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 your patients might be from anywhere in the world, and you should probably, you, you might not even be aware what the frequencies are. So this, these are definitely people who are more vulnerable than to be on the wrong medications. And here, for Europe alone, as I mentioned, there's even variation in, the, in Europe, and you know the uh, the, the um, <clears throat> you know the take home is you know CYP36. Uh, you see more rapid in the north in the south and more slower poor metabolites in the in the in the north, right? So uh, basically, if you move over Europe from south to north, you will you will have a tendency to see poor metabolizers more in the north and and fast metabolizers more in the south, with uh, with areas like Iceland or Faroe or Iceland islands reaching up to 15% of full metabolizer for 2D6. So then again, uh, this, this notion of being an outliers extreme really is no longer valid. And same for CYP2C19, where we see a huge variation also between, between groups in the world with much higher prevalences of CYP2C19 full metabolizers in East Asians as compared to Europeans. And so a while ago, we did a study on, I think, a few hundred people, 184 uh, being treated for um, OCD, which typically requires high doses of antidepressants before, before you see any effects in this population. And, uh, you know, we found poor and revenue metabolizers, but we realized that the numbers were so slow that, you know, we, wouldn't, we would not uh, be able to do a meaningful statistical analysis. So what we first said is we should probably group these extreme 
uh, responders. And rather than to look at response over time, which was not you know, uh, kept in a standardized way, we looked at how many, uh, how many times would need people to be switched away from the medications they were if they were 2D6 rapid or puma metabolizers. And yeah, interestingly, we saw that, you know, those who are at the extreme ends, again, <clears throat> rapid and poor, which were 10 people out of the 180 or so, um, were actually having more clinical trials. They, were, they underwent more clinical trials significantly, which means it took a longer time until they got the right medication uh, without knowing the genotype. So they were, they were blind to the genotypes, but, you know, it took just more long, it just took longer to get them the right medication. And that was interesting and, again, suggestive for the value of, uh, of doing pharmacogenetic testing in that population upfront in order to avoid frustrating clinical trials, which just cost time and money. <clears throat> and then more recently, uh, this study came out looking at estetalopram uh, exposure and uh, therapeutic failure in 2,000 patients, more than 2,000 patients in a Swedish cohort, which was very nicely characterized for their drug levels and so on. And again, this was a retrospective approach. So people, when they were prescribed acetalopram, no one knew about the genotypes and they could see in retrospect that those who were not normal metabolizers and were in the end, you know, on the extremes, were much more likely to be switched away from acetalopram, meaning they have not benefited from it uh, because they were, again, CYP2C19 uh, non-normal metabolizers. And now another, another, you know, uh, another study of the same group um, looked at another cohort of people being treated with aripiprazole and risperidone. These are two medications which are primarily metabolized by CYP2D6. And first of all, what they found was very interesting that physicians who were unaware of the genotype at the time of prescriptions, including their patients, were kind of you know, compensating for what was in retrospect found to be poor, intermediate, normal, and rapid metabolizers by titrating, by stopping titration earlier for, for poor metabolizers, but, 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 but by uh, titrating higher for rapid metabolizers. So we can clearly see that there is a relationship here. There was a compensation, you know, a, a kind of unconscious, if you wish, blind compensation for the genotypes, uh, which was significant, you know, the amount of risperidone prescribed um, among those groups. Uh, and however, you know, despite that compensation, those who were again at the extreme ends at left or right, you know, rapid and poor metabolizers were more likely to be switched away from risperidone, right? Which is, which is again interesting that we cannot just probably even, even if we know the genotype, we might not be able to just compensate for that situation by just yeah, titrating, titrating lower or higher doses. Uh, it might look like these people probably don't benefit as much from, from that drug if they are not in the normal range of metabolism. So well, that was very interesting. <clears throat> and, um, and so um, having said that, I'm gonna introduce you a little bit to uh, our own pharmacogenetic studies that, uh, and services that we've been provided at CAMH uh, since, uh, since now almost 10 years. Uh, we have included about 11,000 subjects or, even, uh, or maybe almost 12,000, I guess. Uh, and this is just a publication where we prescribe the, the whole uh, situation, the whole idea. Uh, and, uh, and now I'm going to show you a, a very interesting result here as well. So <clears throat> uh, look at that. This is, uh, so this is a called impact study. And here is a subsample of about 1,000 uh, um, Europeans below, 1,200 actually. Europeans, again, you saw the distribution earlier, you remember. And now you look, you know, take, take into account that, you know, we are a tertiary care center, which means, you know, we are, we're getting referrals of people who are not doing well in the community with their, with their family physicians, typically, or, you know, uh, maybe, maybe nurse practitioners or potentially even psychiatrists. But at some point when treatment doesn't work well, they send them to us and say, can you take a look and give us some guidance here, what, what we can do? Uh, maybe you have to have some, some additional resources uh, over there, or you have maybe a good idea about a new medication. And now look at the numbers on the right uh, column here. Um, and that's surprising because it really shows that uh, the number of poor metabolizers who are referred to us is much higher than expected. It's 15.4% and rapid are 6.2%, which means we have 21, 22% of people, every fifth patient in the community hasn't, hasn't been doing well, shows an abnormal symptom six metabolizer status. Again, as opposed to the expected numbers, that's striking. And I think that tells us a lesson that, you know, people in the community are often, you know, uh, unconsciously being treated with the wrong medications, which they don't tolerate well, taking them away from that wrong medication, putting them on another medication just, just probably can do the job. 
And another thing is important to keep in mind that, you know, if people have failed medications, there are, uh, you know, failed or if they have only partially responded, you know, uh, unfortunately, certain effects happen, a dynamic happens, which is some, you know, which is often, you know, people are giving up on themselves and maybe also prescribers are, 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 are you know, keeping, keep, you know, treat these people or label them as treatment resistant. And now, you know, they come to us and we get a new start here. We get a restart. We get, you know, maybe if you wish, you know, if you like forensics, you know, this is like cold, a cold case that gets revisited. And now with genetics, we can restart the whole process. And that's alone is, I think, a very valuable moment also and a very eye-opening moment for patients often when they then look back and say, yes, I was on these medications. Now I realize this wasn't, this wasn't matching. So again, it's also the dynamic here, which, which, which I think is, is important to, to keep in mind for for, for people to, 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 to give them a, you know, to give treatment another chance. And then often enough, yeah, uh, you know, the new medications will just, will just do the job. However, um, there's one thing which could be said, well, you know, could this be, you know, uh, uh, also uh, potentially harming people, uh, you know, to give them information. First of all, to hear maybe a poor metabolizer might not be the greatest news. For you, maybe personally, and particularly if people are depressed or anxious, they might see, see the additional failure. But also, you know, will it really, will it really maybe be that the new medication that they will be switched on might actually do harm, you know? So we interviewed 382 physicians over the time uh, from our study, and we asked them, you know, uh, one, one principal question, which was, you know, if you were given treatment recommendations and have taken this into consideration, would you say this compared to Bayesian and your patient has benefited from treatment changes? Yes or no? And we saw an astounding number here, you know, 120 times people improved uh, after recommendations were given, whereas only two times, you know, a minimal worsening was reported. So I think, you know, keeping, uh, keeping in line with the uh, uh, oath of Hippocrates, first do no harm, I think we can clearly say here that, you know, there doesn't seem to be a harm to do pharmacogenic testing, you know, if this was to be one of your concerns. And um, here's another study just to show you also how it can translate for inpatients. Uh, the small study, uh, uh, you know, not, not randomized or anything, but, uh, but, you know, even with a small number of 150 patients or so who were treated as an inpatient, they were able to see a 10-day reduction of inpatient hospitalization stay for those people who were, who were guided with pharmacogenetics as opposed to treatment as usual. And 10 days of inpatient hospital cost a lot of money. That's, uh, we're talking about thousands and thousands of dollars. Uh, which would easily offset the cost for the pharmacogenetic uh, testing of the whole you know, of the whole group here, of the of the entire community here uh, of the sample. So that's I think an impressive again uh, indication that uh, you know uh, in clinical practice this is a useful thing to have. Um, and so, however, the the take home is a little bit you know here at this point. If you have hundred people and you put them. You know, all on the same medication, you know, you will obviously see people who have, who will respond and you will obviously see people who don't respond. But what you, what, what you can also describe as a likelihood of responding, right? The likelihood of responding on the first antidepressant trial, let's say it's 50%. Okay, so that's the current situation. So now you give medications maybe, which is metabolized by, by 2D6, sorry, not 2D16, my apologies, or acetalopram 2C19. Uh, you might you might prescribe them, and now you will see uh, you know there's a group of non-responders, or there's a likelihood you know that 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 there's a, that there is this equal group of non-responders, uh, let's say, and there is a group of responders, right? And now what you do with PGX testing, you're actually removing you're removing a certain amount, let's say here six to twelve people, you know, up to twenty percent as I mentioned earlier. You just remove them now on the on the side of of having a, an a, you know a reasonable adequate likelihood of response. That means they, they do them a favor, obviously, because now they, they have a chance to respond. Uh, but what it really also means is you cannot predict response. You cannot say going, because of your CYP36, you're going to respond on medication X, Y, Z now. But what you can say, you're not on the wrong medication. So it's a little bit like removing a negative outcome, you know, but, that, but that's not the same as, as predicting a positive outcome, right? So I hope that's clear. We're talking about likelihoods. So, and that I think is a fundamental concept at this point of time. Once we have genes, which will also allow us to, to more, say more about response, we're happy to take them. Right now though, we haven't uh, really medications uh, or sorry, genes uh, that we can use to predict response. 
Okay, we, but we have to hence to predict non-response. That's that's the point. That's the whole point here again. So fact check, you know, this, what I just told you is very nice and very interesting and looks very promising, I think, and very convincing, I hope. But, you know, is there more than that? Is there, is there not more evidence out there? And I, and I would like to take you through, uh, you know, uh, uh, where, where, what, is, what is occurring in order to establish uh, or, you know, determine evidence and, and then also to take action. The first thing is, you know, if you do pharmacogenetics, you should be aware of pharma, from gkb.org, the pharmacogenetic knowledge base. You can easily find it online. And here, you know, uh, all medications basically that are out there are, routine, are regularly screened for what is the evidence that there is a gene which in fact, which affects outcome, right? And then they have evidence levels and uh, you can see one, two, three, four. And one is very high, and four is there is no genetic, uh, you know, uh, or there's no evidence for gene affecting uh, response and outcome. And so these medications are graded, right? And we're going to talk about uh, level one and two today because that's where the highest evidence is, and that's where things become interesting, right? Um, and that's the beginning where you would normally determine uh, evidence based, uh, uh, you know, evidence based treatment. And then there is CPIC, and CPIC now is looking at the farm GKB level of, uh, of evidence and then as asking, is there any action that can be taken? For example, if there is only one medication for to treat one disorder and there's only one dose, even if a gene might, might be, you know, might be uh, available, which, which tells you maybe about something about non-response in dosing, but there is no action that you can, yeah, that, that you can make because there's no alternative medication, there's no alternative treatment, and there is no alternative dose, then you know, there would be no action, actionability, right? So here the question is also, is there an actionability? Are there alternative treatments? Are there, are there dosing adjustments that can be done? <clears throat> and if, they are, if these are high, then they get an, a, assigned an A or an B, right? <clears throat> and now, uh, if you look at the psychiatric medications, you can see that out of these 442 gene drug pairs that are on the PharmGKB website the last time I checked, you know, 132 are uh, affecting psychotropic medications and 37 have um, been found, you know, to have, uh, to have higher level of evidence um, by PharmGKB and 32 have been actually also labeled as actionable. And which are these 32? Here they are. So you can see the name of the gene, uh, the name of the drug and the level of evidence, which I just mentioned to you. And you can see that most of them have blue colors, which indicates uh, CYP26 or CYP2C19, uh, just for the ease, I, I have used the same color. And then you can see a few other genes here and there, you know, we're, we're gonna briefly talk about them also in a little bit, but basically you can see how important and how prominent those CYP enzymes are, if you look uh, right, let alone from the, from the level of evidence and actionability. And so um, these are the guidelines which are currently out there from DPIC. And uh, the most recent one was published about opioids and CYP26 and opioid receptor mu one and CMT. Uh, there are guidelines also for atomoxetine used for ADHD. There, there has been two guidelines for uh, each for carbamazepine, oxcarbamazepine for HLA and HLB genes, and also two guidelines already for, for tricyclics and one for SSRI which is currently updated. It's in preparation uh, and part of the group as well. And uh, we are also actually including SNRIs and, uh, and more than just CYP26 and CYP2C19. So keep your eyes open. You will, you will hopefully see in a few months a very nice new CPIC uh, guideline uh, on, that, on, that, on these important antidepressants, uh, which are the most commonly prescribed. And um, what do regulatory agencies now say after we, after we know all this now, you know, what has, what has tripled down basically, so to speak, to regulatory agencies? And that's also an interesting debate because regulatory agencies are seeing things also a bit from a different perspective. You know, it's for them, you know, evidence is one thing for sure, but another thing is also safety, right? So they're often worried also about the safety um, that, you know, might, might not be as much uh, of relevance uh, sometimes, you know, for, for maybe other uh, other, you know, um, groups and then, you know, consortium looking at things, right? Uh, so they, they get triggered a lot if, if something, you know, some, if some potential harm could happen. And interestingly, for CYP26, uh, in the labeling, if you go to the FDA website for CYP26, uh, there are already lots of medications uh, listed in the labeling where they say, if, you're, if you have non normal metabolizer, let's say full metabolizer, be careful, you know, adjust the dose, talk to your doctor, whatsoever, maybe choose, maybe choose something else, you know. So, but again, there is a lot of information already out there 
uh, in, the, in the FDA labeling is mostly related to 2D6, as you can see on the left two columns, a little bit on the left three columns, four columns actually, and then something also on CYPTOC19 and others. But that's, I think, you know, overall, it really means that, you know, if you are once identified in, as, in your lifetime as metabolizer status in a one single lifetime genetic test, that is relevant clinical information. It's like saying I'm allergic to a medication. Then you shouldn't be on penicillin or sulfa or anything if you are allergic to it. Keep that in mind. It's basically a, as a similar kind of very important clinical formation, which should be transported also and basically kept, kept, you know, kept, kept being somewhere in your medical records or so, maybe, or maybe giving you a pass or so, you know, like an ID and showing it to the pharmacist or showing to the doctor and saying, hi, I'm a, uh, my name is so-and-so and I'm a poor metabolizer of D6, just want to let you know in case, you know, you, you have to prescribe medications because it will affect many more medications also than just good psychiatric ones. So um, now I switch gears and I come a little bit to talk about commercial testing kits. Um, because they have done what uh, what 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 is uh, very admirable and very uh, important. They've done some clinical, you know, some randomized clinical trials with people using pharmacogenetic testing versus people who use treatment as usual. And I choose the most two recent ones. Uh, one of them uh, is just was published last year, and another one is about to be published and is going to be presented at ACAC and P meeting also next month in uh, in Puerto Rico. And um, and here, however, you know, I want to I want to highlight one thing, which is you know we we know the numbers are not very high for poor and rapid metabolizers in a in a you know standard uh, general population, and so if you look at the numbers of study number number one, it's three hundred and four, which is which is admirable, and this is a very expensive study to conduct. This study here is three hundred seventy one, and I know what the study costed because I was I was somewhat involved, and this was a four million dollar study or so, right, for three hundred seventy people. And however, you know, uh, this paper below, which again is in, in review process, so bear with me if the, if the text might change a little bit here and there still, but, you know, but, but uh, the conclusion was actually that, you know, because, because the study also was not really supportive uh, by the, you know, primary outcome, but in context of the other studies, which doing, you know, which, which adding, uh, adding more data, you know, then it became, it, things became more interesting and significant. It's just underpowered. So uh, here they said at some point, you know, to achieve 90% power, we would have actually needed 4,000 people. And that is obviously not feasible. That would have probably be a $400 million study now. And uh, I don't think um, that anyone's going to spend so much money uh, for, um, you know, to test if pharmacogenetics really, you know, is superior, which is another question, do we really need to do it? The point here was sometimes commercial companies use their own algorithms, right? They 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 might they might refer to CPIC and they say, okay, well, you know, some some might just exclusively look at CPIC. I'm trying to say, some might say, but we have a we have an own algorithm and so on. And in that case, if they have an own algorithm, I think it's also uh, then uh, required to do a test like you know a randomized clinical trial. Uh, but however, keep in mind that you know we have to probably find compromises here because we can probably. Uh, get to those numbers of studies in order to show something which seems most obvious actually which is you know that if you use those two outliers you will have success now this is a study or a, a review article from a couple of years ago and looking at various companies and you know showing that they are not the same the tests are not using the same genes and not even using the same alleles um, and they're not using the same report so there, there are very different but what they all do at least in common was to include 2d6 and 2c19 at this point when the review was done so that's good news 2d6 and 2c19 should just be on every genetic test uh, in psychiatry if you if you want to ever do something about pharmacogenetics. And uh, a meta-analysis, which was published two years ago, actually showed that if you look at the current RCTs that have been con conducted with uh, several commercial tests, actually shows a clear superiority of pharmacogenetic testing with the treatment usual, despite the heterogeneity of, of tests being used and, and algorithms being used. And the, 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 you know, the last two studies I showed you are going to be soon published also in, in a renewed uh, meta-analysis. So instead of having five samples, you, will, you know, there will be seven. And I can, I can just tell you uh, right from the get-go, the results, <laughs> you know, the, the, the relative risk will be very, very similar. So there's no change. There's no, there's no basically, there's no kind of, you know, bad news here to anticipate, uh, just to let you know. Yeah, so uh, I think, however, 
one critical question is, and this is a great paper to read, just, uh, uh, to read, it's more an opinion paper if you wish, uh, you know, are really are randomized clinical trials really necessary to establish the value of implementing pharmacogenetics into the clinic? And I think it's a great uh, piece of work because, you know, it really lists all the reasons what's, which, uh, which speak against, you know, uh, complex, lengthy and uh, expensive uh, uh, clinical trials, even to the point that even, is it even ethical? Because, you know, if you, if you have a treatment as usual group and you know that there are 2D6 metabolizers among them, is it still ethical to just, to just ignore that and, and just, you know, treat them with medication that might not work for them? So, you know, I leave it up to discussion if you want, but I think that, you know, I wonder sometimes, you know, how much evidence do people really, or do we really need uh, to, to, to state the obvious? Okay, and coming back to regulatory agency, there's also no consensus across the world. Just, just here a picture as an example of the first three medications that are listed, you know, uh, across the world, the regulatory agencies are coming to different conclusions. So it's still very open. Uh, before standardization happens, but I think, you know, standardization will eventually happen, of course, and, uh, and dialogues and conversations and meetings like this are important to teach uh, more about, about that. Um, now I'm coming to the last two gene, genes, I think, which are important for psychiatry. So we heard a lot about 2D6 and 2C19. Now let, let me come to immune, immune system genes uh, first. And then, and then to another gene, uh, just for the sake of completeness. And that is gene variants predisposing to hypersensitivity reactions, right? So, so the situation is that if the, some medication like carbamazepine, phenytoin, lamotrigine, and clozapine can cause uh, idiosyncratic effects, which means you know they can they can they can have a, 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 you know at, um, uh, you know they can trigger the immune system to attack your own your own uh, your own uh, body basically uh, your own healthy cells. Uh, in very, very bad ways. Um, and that is, uh, that is going through this immunological reactions through these HLA and HLB genes. And here, uh, you know, um, uh, this is about the uh, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, which can be, which can be uh, induced by carbamazepine or scarbazepine that looks really very nasty. This is where the, you know, the, the skin cells are really being destroyed by your own immune system, which can be fatally, uh, which can be uh, potentially lethal. And here we have very strong evidence, you know, to say if you if you are carrier of certain gene uh, uh, variants, you should not be on carbamazepine, and if you are not carriers, you can be on carbamazepine uh, very much so because you know you're not having any risk. This variant is more prevalent in East Asians, but not completely absent in non-Asians. So we sh we, we should probably. And this is what happens in the world. In, in countries like Taiwan, I believe this genetic testing is, 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 is required, is mandatory, uh, whereas it's not so much in, in other countries where less agents are living. But I think, you know, if you, if you assemble a panel, put these genes on the panel, please. Uh, you know, they don't, they don't cost you more uh, extra, you know, much extra money to, to test them. And then you're good to go if you, if you ever want to prescribe those medications for mood stabilization, because maybe people don't tolerate lithium or something. And then we have this drug-induced liver injury. Again, this is the last one, but uh, I want to be complete. And uh, so drug-induced liver injury is a whole topic by itself. Basically what it means, you, you take medications these, and for some reasons your genes are such that those, those, uh, those uh, medications will cause a huge problem in your liver. They can destroy liver cells and, uh, and even lead to liver failure. And here for psychiatry, there's one drug here, which is valproic acid, which can in fact induce liver injury. Uh, you know, if you have POLG gene mutations, okay? And that, uh, you know, the point here is though, those mutations are, and as the name already said, they're not polymorphisms, they're, they're a mutation, they're rare. But if you have a family history, you know, of, of, of mitochondrial issues or, or any kind of, you know, abnormalities, uh, you know, you should screen for these genes. And again, uh, for these variants, uh, these are two, two gene variants that you should look at uh, and that, that then they should also be on a panel if you can. Uh, you know, if you were to design a panel. And we have uh, come up a couple of years ago uh, with the idea, what is the most evidence-based uh, genes that we should then have if we were to, you know, if, you were, if we were to design one for our, for our patients. And here is the answer. Uh, you can see big five or big six, you know, depending if you use a, if you use a POLG now, because uh, it, it has a, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention, another farm GKB level evidence only of three. That's why it's not officially included in those, you know, high up there. But because it's only level three, because there isn't so much data, because it's a rare, it's a rare event, and to to, to you know to collect large samples takes a long time. So that's why you know we can say big five or big six. But this would be the genetic test you should at least have 
you know, uh, if, if, if you do it the most evidence-based way, you can use more genes for experimental issues or maybe because you've come up with a genius algorithm or so on, right? Uh, there's, not, there's nothing wrong with doing experiments, but that's basically the minimum uh, that should be on a gene panel. But you can see how many medications are affected, right? And this is like a lot of medications which are routinely prescribed uh, very frequently in patients. So uh, that I think is a nice summary here uh, to, to highlight you know, the gene drug pairs of interest. And uh, now, are there anyone who's doing, who's implementing those um, genes, uh, gene drug pairs, you know, just for curiosity, where is, this, where is the action who's doing this? And this is uh, also taken from the website of, I believe, from GKB. And you can see that, you know, <clears throat> many centers in the U.S. have, have picked up pharmacogenetic testing and uh, offer this on a very routine basis. It doesn't have to be just psychiatric medication. This is everything. But you can see that, you know, uh, renowned places uh, uh, in the U.S. and across the world are, are just saying, you know, you can do, you can, you know, we, we have enough. We've seen enough. You know, we've seen enough to... Uh, to move on and implement it, you know, we don't need to wait for another uh, and for another study and another study and another group and another consensus and so on, or for another regulatory agencies telling us, you know, we are just going to do that. And again, very prominent clinics here are involved, and they they clearly rely on the CPIC, uh, uh, you know, CPIC uh, recommendations. <clears throat> so, in summary, or interim summary, I would say, you know, robust evidence. Uh, Definitely support the clinical utility of PGX and pharmacogenetics currently for at least those five genes. Uh, those are increasingly being adopted globally, nationally, locally. And uh, barriers, however, are there, particular education. That's why I appreciate also uh, to, to uh, have those sessions like today, um, because many people just don't know about it or misunderstand it or you receive conflicting uh, information and are unsure what to do and what to, what to believe. You know, we see the same happening with COVID vaccine vaccinations, if you want. Uh, and, um, and then ultimately, however, one thing I like to mention, though, you know, uh, there is, there is I am not aware of a case where anyone has been sued for not, for not at least discussing pharmacogenetics, uh, uh, you know, for poor metabolism status in patients. But there has been a lawsuit against uh, against the company who has uh, produced uh, who is you know, manufacturing uh, clopidogrel because they failed to indicate that CYP2C19 poor metabolizers would be um, uh, would would uh, not you know because clopidogrel is a pro drug they would not build high enough levels to really protect them against uh, blood clots and so many people in East Asia and the Oceanian uh, region uh, in Hawaii died because of that um, until there was a lawsuit initiated in Hawaii. Uh, asking and inquiring about the, the you know the liabilities of uh, of those gene drug pairs, and again, I'm just cautioning that this might happen to any one of us who's prescribing medication, if we're not you know responsibly telling uh, a patient that you know this 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 situation is so and so, and there is there is a test out there that you know they might want to know about, right? Okay, um, and now. Um, the question is, should we do it routinely? Should we use, should we basically go and test everyone uh, who comes into a physician's office? I think at this point of time, to be pragmatic and to be cost effective, we should consider it at least if someone has failed on a previous medication, because then we can, we, you know, then we want to make sure that the next one is going to be not one of the, not one of the, you know, uh, uh, less, less likelihood of response type of medications. We should uh, keep in mind for patients with comorbidities, also including genetic syndromes, because this can, you know, this can be a double uh, whammy situation. And people with polypharmacy also, by the way, people who have psychiatric polypharmacy, who sometimes come with a long list of medications and you don't know which one to start stopping, which one you should increase. Do a genetic test and you will find out better which ones you, you should probably discontinue, which one you might want to increase. And then also ethnic minorities. If you have patients from ethnic minorities, you, you have no clue about uh, their frequencies of being maybe potentially poor rep metabolizers. Well, keep it in mind that you know you want to look into them uh, because you know you just you just can't go by 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 a simple uh, you know simple uh, uh, guesstimate, right? So that this is I think you know the answer to the question about routine testing and and yes. Um, in a pragmatic way, ideally, in the ideal world, everyone would have a genetic test done, you know, a long time ago, uh, have it somewhere on their, you know, on a, on a hardware or, or on, a, on an ID card, but, you know, the reality is not there yet. So, but uh, the pragmatic approach here would be to, to at least, you know, include and consider that in those uh, in scenarios. Right. If you want to learn more, a little bit of shameless self-promotion, if you want, uh, if you want to learn more about that, 
Uh, here are uh, re recent reviews. And this one is uh, with the one which was done with the International Society of Psychiatric Genetics and, and has taken us you know, a good amount of time to, to, to get through, through the genes and drug person to get a consensus among these you know, world-class researchers in psychiatric genetics. Here's another one which was done with my uh, student over two summer times periods, uh, Lara Murphy. This is coming out of molecular psychiatry and is focusing on resonate psychotics and again summarize everything nicely from a level of evidence and clinical application. So this might come out anytime soon on PubMed. And um, then uh, if I have two more minutes, um, I'm passionate about looking into the genetics of antipsychotic use weight gain for many years. And I have a fellow, a postdoc fellow, who is working with me. Uh, his name is Kazuo Yoshida. Uh, and, uh, you know, the idea here was, you know, what, where we started a few years ago was to really look into, into that, uh, into that um, side effect because it's so detrimental, right? It can, uh, with the lanzapine and clozapine, a particular clozapine, which is, which is the best probably working antipsychotic, particularly in more severe cases, right? Unfortunately, it has such a huge uh, liability of weight gain. And that's why it's then often kept away and, you know, really, uh, really not used probably earlier than it should be from a clinical symptom point of view. But if we can identify now people who are at low risk, at high risk, we could, we could much better now, you know, guide them through their, through their close of treatment, right? Um, and therefore, we have looked over the years into single genes at a time, you know, a BDNF was, there was a signal with BDNF that could be involved in antipsychotic use weight, and there was a signal also with the neuropeptide Y gene. You know, these are all genes involved in the appetite and satiety uh, regulation system, the hypothalamus, which, which is apparently affected by antipsychotic medication. This is where they kind of do something where people start to eat more. Anyway, we looked at the leptin gene. There's also some inconsistent genes between ethnicities. Um, and then, you know, a highlight was the melanin protein 4 receptor gene, which, which, we, uh, which we and our collaborator in New York uh, uh, wrote a very nice paper a few years ago about uh, showing you know, how it nicely replicates uh, in, a, in a recessive way, uh, which huge increase, which huge, uh, which higher risk uh, um, of weight gain across samples from, from the world, which was really nice. And now we started to build our own little combinatorial approach. Uh, and this is still not published here. This is, uh, this is you know, very simplistic, if you wish. But the idea was, you know, if you have one to three risk variants, we saw only minimal weight gain increase. If you have four or five, you're in between. You have, you know, what about, about five to 6% of risk of weight gain from your baseline when you start the medication. But if you have six, seven, or eight, you know, you are at risk of at least gaining 10 to 15% of your weight. And that's something we'd like to evaluate in samples, you know, in, in larger samples now. If, so if anyone of you is interested in collaboration has samples on weight gain, we'll be happy to tell you, you know, the genes that we looked in here and, and, and the variants and, you know, see what, 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 if we can replicate that. So um, that's hopefully where we will at, at some point have a genetic tool to, uh, uh, you know, to guide and support a treatment uh, based on weight gain liability. And with that, I'd like to thank my group, uh, amazing group here in Toronto. Um, this is the larger neurogenetics group. Most of people, however, are involved in pharmacogenetic research. Uh, if you are interested, you know, if you're really working into this field, if you're really interested in learning more, uh, the Pharmacogenomics Global Research Network, PGRN, uh, uh, we have recently uh, built a new group called the, you know, Pharmacogenetics uh, in Psychiatry Interest Group. Um, uh, and, you know, it's, uh, you, everyone is welcomed. Uh, we have um, seminars, uh, meetings around every two, two months. We will, uh, we will build an educational meeting, hopefully that in person for the next year or so. Um, and we share just knowledge and great networking uh, also among them. And we're now about 100, 100 members or so. Uh, and uh, please just uh, contact me or just look it up online. And if, you, if you're interested, I'll, I'll, I'll put you on the member list, all right? And that's it. I'll stop here and thank you very much for your time, for your patience, for your attention. I hope uh, I hope that was um, <laughs> I hope that was a, a new and interesting information for you. Thank you. That was great. Thanks, Dr. Mueller. Um, for everyone in attendance, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q and A box. <clears throat> Feel free to put questions in there, and I'll I'll keep an eye on that, and uh, we'll relay those questions to Dr. Mueller. Um, if you don't get your question asked, you can always email us medicalaffairs at genomine.com and we'll try to uh, relay that to Dr. Mueller. So um, while we're waiting, I think I have a couple of questions for you, Dr. Mueller. So you, you mentioned your relationship with CPIC. 
um, and talk briefly about the um, the updates for the antidepressant guideline. Can you talk a little bit more about that and also give us a um, sort of a sneak peek into the antipsychotic guideline? Wonderful. Yeah, great question. Yeah, so the uh, SSRI uh, CBA guideline is is being uh, is being written as we speak, as being uh, as being you know being reviewed at least the evidence, and not written yet. But uh, it's uh, it's a lot of lot of data, um, which is great. Um, uh, lots of uh, and and I like CPIC because they have you know different different experts you know we have pharmacologists we have psychiatrists we have geneticists you know uh, there is a nice uh, you know nice nice diversity here uh, where we are now I think we just concluded uh, the SSRIs and we actually looked at the first SNRIs now menofaxine and duloxetine um, and on top of on top of uh, the CYP26 and 2C19, I can just say that we're going to have the most likely the, the serotonin 2A receptor also included. Maybe more. It's a little bit of time. It's about now to be discussed um, as a sneak peek, so to speak. And uh, and I'm I'm desperate for the <laughs> guideline for antipsychotic. Personally, I've been I think I've been uh, really um, harassing uh, almost you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the pick for some time now where why don't we do the guideline uh, where is it and you know they promised they promised uh, to you know uh, first of all uh, you know there are lots of other gene drug pairs out there you know uh, no because they're not just dream psychiatric ones but they promised that once we have this the ssri and SNRI done that would be the next in line so hopefully 2022 you know we'll see the first uh, the first action happening that would be amazing well we look forward to that for sure Okay, uh, a couple of questions trickling in from the audience here. One question is one I was going to ask. So it has to do with um, what kind of barriers you see to the implementation of pharmacogenetics. You mentioned um, education before, but what other barriers do you, do you see? Um, and then, when do you think we'll get to the point where it's it's standard of care or or more routine? Yeah, thank you for this question. Uh, one one thing which I couldn't really go into in much detail about the barriers is, of course, you know, who's the, the cost, right? Uh, and 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 it's also, um, you know, uh, that is of course also dependent on the on the healthcare system uh, and the and the region you you, you do live, right? Uh, it might not be the same in the U.S. or it might not be the same in certain states, and so on. And uh, and it might not be the same for younger people and older people. There's Medicare, Medicaid, also the U.S. And they started actually, interestingly, to um, to reimburse genetic testing. You know, I think Medicare, Medicaid have made have made significant moves towards that, at least for these, you know, evidence-based genes to, to say, we should, we should do this, we should, we should reimburse them. Um, so uh, cost-effectiveness studies are also needed in order to convince payers. Now, most cost-effectiveness studies actually that I'm aware of have actually shown positive effects. So, so you know, savings of money, uh, as you can imagine, as I mentioned earlier, 10 days of inpatient care, it's a lot of money. Uh, you can easily offset the cost for testing everyone. Um, uh, and interestingly, you know, they're so significant, I mean, they're, they're, they're mostly so positive that, that you might even wonder at some point, is this maybe a better measure to use <laughs> than, you know, response uh, as of symptoms? Because, you know, if a study has failed uh, showing that, you know, like uh, the response of symptoms, you know, the, the reduction of symptoms has not been as significant or as non significant uh, between pharmacogenetics and treatment as usual, you know, but then you see cost-saving effects, those people later just need to go less to the doctors and need to go less uh, to emergency rooms or to, to inpatients. I mean, then it's an indirect measure of saying, um, you know, something must have helped them uh, better than those who haven't received pharmacogenetics. So uh, I think that, uh, you know, perhaps these studies should actually be given more attention and, and so on, because they, they clearly show a huge benefit actually and um and uh, however for the time being people are not being reimbursed typically so um, in most in most you know most regions although uh, if they are lucky they have a health insurance if, if they go to certain institutions right if you go to to these highly specialized institutions you go to the mayo clinic you go to cleveland clinic you know you might get the testing included basically as a as a service right um, but basically, um, as a service, well, you pay, of course, for the, for, for, for the treatment, but if the treatment is covered already by your insurance, you know, it will be included. So, uh, however, most of the time it's not paid, let's say, and that's a, that's a barrier. The second one was definitely education. People just don't know much about it or get a little bit confused and a little bit, uh, a little bit you know, misled. And, uh, well, what else? I mean, um, 
I think, I think, yeah, I think there is also how a clinic is run, okay? Um, uh, for example, I can see that pharmacists are often much more open to implement pharmacogenetics. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, it, at that time when, when, when they discuss medication with patients, you know, they, 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 they might have also different approach to things. They probably see also the patient at the whole and not just for a, for a, for a focused medication. But in, in the clinical practice, sometimes it's, it's seen as disruptive to say, okay, I'm having the patient here for 45 minutes and I need to make a decision, uh, you know, what, what, the, what the diagnosis and give a medication prescription and then boom, I see the next one. This is how my clinic works and this is how many clinics work. Now, if you have the same patient and say, well, you first go to the next test and come back in a week and then we're going to see each other again, you know, many clinics are not built for that. So they're not ready. So it also depends on how, how we shape our healthcare system, which is, which is another barrier, I think. And those, I think, are the main ones. So education, cost effectiveness, and clinical practicability. And again, we see, however, and, and, and interestingly, I, mean, I was mentioning clinical practicability because we sometimes see more, more hesitance from psychiatrists who should actually be, I think, very much interested than from pharmacists or from patients. Patients, if you ask them about, you know, do you like pharmacogenetically tested, you know, 90% or more are saying, sure, of course, if that's, if that's available uh, and, and, and so on, I want to know. You know, the pharmacist might, might be, I don't know, just give a random number, but I'm just saying, you know, might be 70% of, 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 of being convinced. And maybe the psychiatrists are out there with 30, 40% you know, of being convinced, somewhat, somewhat, you know, just to give a scale, it's more a relative scale rather than numbers. And, and that's interesting to see, I think. I think that was a good segue into this next question here. So how do you talk to patients about pharmacogenetic testing. I, th I think patients sometimes overestimate what pharmacogenetic testing can do. So how do you discuss it with them and set the limitations and expectations with them? Yeah, excellent question. Thank you for that. I think, uh, you know, as I mentioned a bit earlier, um, I teach them very much about the principle of not being on the wrong medications. But then if they, take an, if they go to, to, the, to, the, to the other medication then, which are left, and there are still quite a good number to be left, that will not predict uh, success, okay? So I want to not oversell it. I don't want to raise overly high expectations. I carefully, cautiously say, all we can do and all we should do here is to make sure you're not on the wrong medication. And then I think most, most, most of the time, then, you know, this, is, uh, this, this worked very well. And, uh, and, and that's, I think, yeah, that's, I think, how I would normally do it. And then, of course, depending on the case by case, if there are more questions about so and so and, you know, whatnot, of course, we will also review that. But I'm cautioning, certainly, first of all, to, to raise to my expectations. But I would be, on the other hand, promoting it as a way of, of, being, of, of doing personalized treatment. Okay, great. I think we have time probably for one more question. And this is an interesting one. So... Um, do you know of any applications of pharmacogenetics in a prison population? So the, the estimate is that about 30% of incarcerated people have a psychiatric condition. So do you know of any examples where this has been implemented in that population? Wonderful question as well. A few years ago, I thought this might be a great study population actually to look at because, uh, you know, and I don't want to be cynical or anything like that, but, you know, this is a population you can easily follow up for, for the course of time without having to, to be afraid of too many dropouts potentially, because, you know, the reality is, you know, prospective studies often don't work well because people then get too busy and they have their jobs and they have other things. And, and you know, often enough, you, you have a lot of dropouts. Uh, and I thought, you know, patient population in prison might, might be there for the next uh, few months or so for sure, and you know where to find them. But again, not being sarcastic or anything, but basically, however, the one problem is, with prison was that why we didn't do it first at all, it's, it's, it's very demanding to do this with prison population. You, know, you have to go through a lot, of, a lot of paperwork, ethic concerns, and so on, safety, and blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, there's a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of uh, substance uh, comorbidity, substance use comorbidity uh, in that population, which will easily uh, also, you know, uh, become a problem. And also, you know, compliance, non-compliance, and so on is... Uh, it might be at high risk, you know, there might, you know, there's, there's biases there, you know, that might just, you know, uh, be hard to, hard to, um, hard to uh, circumvent or, you know, hard to, hard to over, overcome. So it's, it's, a complex, it's a complex issues. But what I can say is for forensic patients, you know, forensic patients in psychiatric institutions, there, 
I think you know we have a great I think uh, opportunity and the missed opportunity so far uh, to you know to really see that you know uh, because those people have to you know have to stay in in a psychiatric institute as long as they are ill as long and and if they don't show compliance you know again they might they might be uh, uh, not not being discharged and here I think we have a great opportunity to 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 uh, optimize treatments through pharmacogenetics because for example rapid metabolizers will just not build any samples. And I've heard about cases being, you know, wrongly accused of being non-compliant because the serum levels were always low. Someone did, did a metabolite analysis. You know, you don't need to do pharmacogenetics all the time to find out if someone's a rapid metabolizer. You can look at the metabolites if you have it, if you get it sometimes, and then you get an idea, right? But if it doesn't exist a metabolite, do the pharmacogenetic testing. And then they found out that these people were rapid metabolizers and they were wrongly accused of being non-compliant. And I mean, this is really tragic, right? If you, are, if you talk about people who are, who are forced to be in a psychiatric institution because of a forensic issue. Well, that, that puts us right around at the bottom of the hour. So Dr. Mueller, this was great. Appreciate your time today. Um, for everyone who's still with us, we will be sending out uh, a recording of this or at least posting a recording of this on our website, and we'll be sending out the slides to everyone who's, uh, who's registered. So I appreciate everyone's time. Again, thanks to Dr. Mueller, and take care, everyone. Thank you so much.